book of Hebrews chapter 1. And we're going to spend the day in this book. And we're especially going to be focusing on, uh, in just a while, the 11th chapter. It has always been one of my favorite chapters, but uh, as you begin to see what um, that chapter is really all about, you will come to, to, to grow to appreciate it even more. When you realize that though these people were examples to us and we can use the, uh, them as illustrations for our own Christian life, they are truly examples to the remnant church in the tribulation period. And that's why the, uh, the Apostle Paul, who is the author of Hebrews, um, included these particular people. Uh, they are outstanding believers regardless of the dispensation. When we get to chapter 11, they are especially um, uh, reminiscent of those who are examples for uh, the kingdom on earth. Now, one of the things we want to do here is uh, just um, do a little uh, preaching before we do a little teaching. Verse number 1, Hebrews chapter 1. God, who at sundry times and in different manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. The point that um, uh, the author is making here is that God has spoken. And, you know, we all always hear those uh, uh Characters uh, that are larger than life, uh, that are kings or w what have you, that have the final authority, and they say, I have spoken. That's it. Don't want to hear it again. And uh, that's more or less the concept here that the highest authority in the universe has uttered some words and they are of utmost importance to us, or especially the, the kingdom church. God has spoken. And then it says in verse number two, has in these last days spoken unto us by his son. Now we're just going to uh, read a, a little devotional here. This morning's devotional actually in um, Our Daily Bread. This fellow Dave Eigner says this, one of my sons was a master at tuning out what he didn't want to hear. In church, his mind was a million miles away. He could tell you the number of panels in the ceiling and how many seats were in the choir loft. Many times I heard my wife say to him in the midst of a scolding, Are you listening to me? No, I can't hear you. <laughs> we too are often guilty of tuning out what we don't want to hear, even messages from God. Uh, in his book, Christian Reflection, C.S. Lewis says, that a person who is determined to ignore God's voice will follow this advice. Avoid silence. Now, I'm reading this because if you will uh, just observe, these are characteristics of our world today. Avoid silence. Uh, Miss Mita, we, we talked about that this morning. It was so peaceful here. We, we almost wanted to take up our perch in the pew and just <laughs> get 50 winks or 40 winks would have done. Anyway, this is the advice they'll follow if they don't want to listen to, a God, to God. Avoid silence. Avoid solitude. Avoid any train of thought that leads off the beaten path. Concentrate on money, sex, status, health, all of the above, your own grievances. Keep the radio on. Live in a crowd. Isn't that today's world? B you know, busy here, busy there, but, it, but it's always noise. It's always doing something. It's always distraction. Because when you are quiet, there is one person that is still talking to you that you don't want to hear, and that's God. So it says when we do something wrong, that's one time when we especially need to listen to God's voice. But often in our stubbornness, he says, we close our ears. Anyway, the author of Hebrews says, God has spoken, in verse number two, in these last days he's spoken unto us by his son. Now, we'll just put the Lord Jesus Christ up here. He is now speaking now, whether you're talking about Jesus Christ uh, as God revealed him under law to the Apostle Peter and the last days there, or as Jesus Christ as he is speaking under grace, as God has revealed him to the Apostle Paul, still God is speaking through his son. 
And is anybody listening? I was uh, interested uh, in uh, seeing that fellow by the name uh, of Paul Burrell. Paul Burrell was a uh, butler bodyguard, butler slash bodyguard to Princess Diana. And supposedly he removed some of her uh, valuables, uh, priceless, precious things for safekeeping. Uh, and uh, nobody believed him when he said, well, that's what I was doing because he was found out. And in the midst of the court trial, uh, they were ready uh, to put him in jail, you know, make him pay the price. And all of a sudden, Queen Elizabeth II spoke and said, oh, I remember <laughs> that he told me this before it happened, that he was going to remove these things for safekeeping. Nobody listened until Queen Elizabeth spoke. And it's the very same thing with uh, the people in Hebrews or uh, grace believers today. God is speaking through his son. Are we listening? And for the most part, uh, Christendom today is not listening to the Pauline message, to the authority and the words that Christ gave to this man. But the important thing here is we're in the book of Hebrews is that God is speaking through his son in the last days to them. All right? And note the authority given to Christ, whom he hath appointed heir of all things. Now, all through the writings, the Hebrew writings, it talks about an inheritance or a lot or an allotment. And that simply means that in eternity future on this earth, people are going to have parceled out to them a certain amount of property. Uh, you know, half acre, acre, eight acres, a state, <laughs> a nation, what have you. And um, Jesus Christ, even though uh, uh, they are not associated with him like we are, Jesus Christ still is going to share his inheritance with others. But you've got to make it to the kingdom to get there. And that's why the author of Hebrews begins focusing their eyes on the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who is going to come and bring his reward with him. Now, you're either going to be in the kingdom or not, or you're going to get rewarded or not for your faithfulness. So it says, last part of verse 2, God has appointed him heir of all things. Uh, I mean, if he's got the monopoly on possessions... You have got to stand in good stead with him to get your uh, comeuppance. By whom he made the worlds, being the brightness of his glory, the express image of his person, upholding all things by the word of his power, when he by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Okay? The, the next thing that he focuses on is the fact that here is God in his throne. On his right hand is another throne that is the highest delegated authority in the universe. Now, Israel is always looking back to the law of Moses and the sacrifices there for their salvation. And all of a sudden, now Jesus Christ has come and established the new covenant. The new covenant that has better promises, that has better blood, and a better salvation. Uh, associated with it. But where is that now? Well, it's vested in the Lord Jesus Christ so that instead of looking back to the law, they need to look up to him because he now has purchased their salvation and their sins. So all of this is focusing not on Antichrist, but on Jesus Christ who has come. All right, now let's move then to verse number one of chapter two. Verse number one of chapter two. And it says at this, this point, therefore. Now, the therefore points back to the reasons he has stated in the previous chapter. It is a conclusion based on the fact that since, since God is now speaking through Jesus Christ, since salvation is in him, since he's seated at the right hand of the Father, God sanctions uh, him. Since he is coming back with, uh, with uh, salvation and rewards, that they need to keep their eyes focused on him and what he said. You know, when uh, Dusty Wilson presented his um, little uh, uh, 
presentation on the Pentagon and the fact that he was there, he started off with a Verizon commercial. And uh, he went around the room and put his little uh, phone up to his ear and said, can you hear me? And then he'd walk over about five yards and said, can you hear me now? And then he'd walk over, can you hear me now? And uh, the foundation he laid was, um, God is speaking. Have you heard him? I'm sad to say, people heard him about one or two weeks here in America. And then when they found out that nothing else was going to really happen to them, it's back to, you know, life as usual. Who cares? But up until that point, oh, God, please don't bomb us. Please don't give us an earthquake and anthrax and the rest of it. Don't let us have war. But uh, Jesus Christ is coming back and they're going to have to face him. And so he says, therefore, based on this, we ought to. Now, one more thing about this ought business. And I would say that to us. Ought comes from an old English word meaning to owe. Because of these things we owe, or there is a moral obligation to give heed to them. And uh, in the dispensation of grace, the same thing is true. Your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ is directly related to your interest in his word. If his word is not that important to you, you ought to hear it. You ought to obey it. You ought to do what he says. But if that is insignificant to you, uh, therefore, uh, you're under the, the moral condemnation that comes with disobedience to God. Uh, these things ought to be, says the author of Hebrews to them. We ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. Now, with regard to letting things slip, again, uh, just some of these things hit me in the, the past week with regard to what is being taught here in the book of Hebrews and our modern day. Nobody seems to be listening. The things that are essential and important, who cares? And in order to get people to, to hear, you've got to have the dog and pony show. I mean, you've got to, to have people doing cartwheels and all that to get people to come to church just to, just to speak to them. Uh, whenever uh, the, the author of this book says we ought to do it, we're under moral obligation. It's God who's speaking. It's God's Son who has been authorized to speak for it, the Father. It's God's Son who has provided salvation. There's, salva there's not salvation in anybody else. It's God, the Son, who sits at the, uh, sits at the right hand of the Father. So it uh, goes on here. We ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we've heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. Now again, there was an article on the promise keepers. Now, they say that the Promise Keepers at this point is about five million strong. It's a men's movement, and they're going after teenage uh, boys. And again, it's this business of, of marketing things rather than just saying, God wants you in church to learn the word under your right pastor teacher. God has spoken. It's we've got to do various things to draw their interest. And here were the things. You, among this age group, have to have Christian rock bands. You have a Christian rock band, you're going to get a crowd. Anytime you have contemporary music with people jumping and jiving and the rest of it, you'll, you'll get them. Then something we faced at the conference, hip-hop artists. And, you know, I want to say, dear God, have mercy on us. Why don't you just eradicate the lot of the human race? When we have to go to hip-hop artists... Really, we have to go to that to get people to come to church. And up there at the conference, I had people argue with me and snub me. Hmm. Yeah, some of you were around when that when that girl I was I was helping Alice Blue at the uh, at the organ, and she wanted to talk with me immediately. Who did I think I was? And I I said, you know, just give me a second here. Let me help Alice. And she turned her nose up in the air and walked walked around. If I could, well, no, I better not say that. <laughs> but I thought it. But she wanted to know why they couldn't do Christian hip-hop there. 
and uh, I'll not use names, but I had enough hip hop with uh, um, with one of the speakers to do me enough. Extreme sports exhibitions. You got to do extreme things to get these kids' attention. And, uh, testimonials from these stars and scores of fast-paced videos. Is anybody listening? The, the Apostle Paul says, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard. Why? Because of who Christ is and where the Father has placed him and what he has done and the authority that he holds in our lives. I mean, why do we have to listen to a Queen Elizabeth when God, through his son, has spoken and nobody's paying attention to it, uh, per se? Now, here we uh, have in verse number one, one of the first references to the fact that the book of Hebrews is written to those who could lose their salvation. And the last part of the verse says this lest at any time we should let them slip. Now, Jesus Christ has spoken, but there can come a point where, and he goes in the, in the book of Hebrews, says you've become dull of hearing. Um, you're not listening anymore. And the things that you have learned, you're going back on. And so, Holding fast the words of Jesus Christ unto the end, um, uh, they're, they're not doing that. They're in danger of losing it. And that's why he says, unless at any time we should let them slip. For, now he's going to make a contrast between what Moses said here and what Christ says here. And it's important contrast because it's going to give, uh, uh, here's the word, clout to what he's saying. If you listen to Moses, you ought to listen to Christ. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, I mean, if God established it uh, uh, through Moses and people had to obey that, Every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation which at first began to be spoken by the Lord, Jesus Christ? I mean, if you think most, the words of, of God to Moses were steadfast and that every infraction was going to be judged and punished, the same thing is going to be, uh, happen if we reject the, uh, the um, uh, Lord Jesus Christ. Now, um, or should I put it this way in verse number three? How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? You see, there's a difference, and I use the word reject, but actually I should have used the word neglect here. Because actually both things can be true of the Jews. One, you can reject the words of Christ and never get saved to begin with. And uh, the Apostle Paul is a prime example of that. Paul, the reason God had Paul write this book was to show the Jews that God did exactly what he said he'd do to, to a person who rejected Jesus Christ uh, with, um, with God the Holy Spirit testifying that he was indeed the Messiah. And that was Paul uh, hardened his heart to the point that he could not get saved. He, he rejected uh, the kingdom gospel and he could not get saved. How did God save him? He saved him in another dispensation. He saved him by establishing grace. So he could write back to them and say, hey, look, uh, I rejected it. I, I now am saved. That's true. But I rejected it. And I can testify to the fact that God judged me. And were it not for the exceeding abundant grace of God, I would never have been saved. And that's why he had him to write this book. He stands as a testimonial to one who rejected the kingdom message and could not get saved. Had, had he lived in the uh, tribulation period, Paul would have taken the mark of the beast. However, he is not addressing those Jews that have rejected necessarily. He is writing the book of Hebrews to holy brethren 
People who have accepted but are doing what to the message? Neglecting it. Now, what does that mean? Well, it simply means that if they neglect it, they stand in danger of losing it. They could lose their salvation. And that's why this book is being written as a warning. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at first began to be spoken by the Lord, was confirmed unto us by them that heard him, God bearing witness, signs and wonders, the Holy Ghost as well, according to his will. And, and so from this point on, he has, he has set us up. Jesus Christ is the one speaking for God in the last days for Israel. And Jesus Christ has been recognized of God, authorized of God. He's got everything in him. He's got the monopoly on possessions and salvation. It's his blood. It's his priesthood, the Melchizedekian one. And so you have, say you have salvation. Watch because you're beginning to neglect it and you can lose it. All right, let's move on down here this very same chapter. Now, here's where you and I ought to perk up our ears and become interested in the angelic conflict. I believe that, uh, and I had somebody up at the conference to ask me, well, why do we have to write books about grace? And why were the books of Paul so important? Uh, and will they be important to the kingdom church of the future? And the answer to that is, uh, yes, they will be. They are going to uh, show what God did during the time of the gap, when, God, uh, when Israel was uh, scattered and then Israel was regathered to the land. But it's also going to mean, if they're reading these books, it's also going to mean that the church was victorious in the angelic conflict. Now, before somebody says, well, that's, that's a relief, remember that dispensation is not finished. I said, if they're reading these books. So you've got, uh, you've got the body church here, and you've got the future kingdom church here. They're, they're going to look back, and if they're reading these books, they were victorious. But why should we be interested in the book of Hebrews through Revelation? Because these books tell us that it's possible for the kingdom church to fail. Now, mind you, the kingdom church looks at us and we look to the kingdom church. They'll look back and hopefully see somebody that's victorious. But we're looking forward saying, go get them, boys. Be victorious. Why? Because if we fail, might as well forget their program. If they fail... You might as well forget ours. Everything is contingent upon Jesus Christ subduing the entire universe. Not just the second heaven or not just the earth. It has to be the entire thing or the angelic conflict is lost. So let's look at this. That's why the author of Hebrews begins to focus on the angelic conflict. Verse 5. For unto the angels he hath not put in subjection the world to come, whereof we speak. Oh, let's, let's stop here. And... Okay. Here is the age to come, right here, the kingdom. Here uh, the author of Hebrews is writing, looking toward that point. And he is reminding them that when the kingdom comes... And that's what he's referring to. He's not referring to our position in the second heaven. He's referring to the fact that uh, before Adam, there were angels on this planet. Lucifer had the chief throne. And that throne is going to be given to Jesus Christ as the son of David. But that the entire earth has to be ruled by men. If there is even one angel that can claim a throne because a man has failed to, to accomplish it and God's program has been thwarted, then everything is up for grabs. And so he reminds them, angels don't have the, uh, the subduing of this world in mind when the kingdom comes. But one in a certain place testified, what is man that you're mindful of him and the son of man that you visit him? 
Now, when, when we talk about this here, we looked at the term the, the son of man before. But also in co connection with that, it is man. God is looking at two categories of human beings to uh, be victorious in the angelic conflict. Category uh, number one, son of man. We went through and just briefly understood that the son of man is a special title for the Lord Jesus Christ. The son of man has to do with him being the second Adam and recovering the dominion mandate uh, uh, from uh, fallen Adam's hands. He gets back the dominion mandate and has a right to rule. That's why Isaiah 9 says that uh, Jesus Christ has the government on his shoulder. But Jesus Christ is no longer on the earth, according to um, uh, chapter 1. And so he mentions man, believing men, men who are going to go through the tribulation period and have a tendency to give up, to draw back into perdition, to let the, their salvation slip, to neglect this so great salvation, to lose their salvation, take the mark of the beast. And he's just reminding them uh, of the fact that, um, that if they do that, and there is no remnant left at, at this point, that all is lost. Because God has to have enough men to staff the thrones on earth. And the book of Hebrews now takes on a very, very somber tone. Uh, this is serious. This is important. So he goes on. Uh, verse number seven. And in these, uh, what are fantastic uh, verses of Scripture, he's pointing them back to the Lord Jesus Christ. Here they are going through the tribulation, and he's pointing them back to Christ, his cross, and his life of suffering. Verse number 7. You made him, both the Son of Man and man, a little lower than the angels. You crowned him, both, with glory and honor. You did set him, now it's mainly Jesus Christ, over the works of your hands. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. That is potential. Let's, let's go back. Here's Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ has something potential. But now... What did Jesus Christ do in order to get this potential to have all things put on? The Father said, well, you're my son in whom I'm well pleased. I'm now going to give you back everything. It's because of what's called the strategic victory of Christ. That's a G there. So here you have a mountain that's going up in this way, and Jesus Christ is King of the hill, as it were. But Jesus Christ is not the only one in this ballgame. He's not the only one in this war. Men are. So here's what he says. Last part of verse number 8. And here is the warning. But now we see not yet all things put under him. What does that mean? What kind of talk is this? All things are put under him, but not all things are put under him. He is the son of man, but there's another category. Man. Believing men have to climb the hill in what's called a tactical victory. Tactical, okay? Victory. They've got to earn their thrones as they climb the mountain. Jesus Christ has the right to rule the mountain, but he also has to subdue uh, all things with the men who are believing. 
If he doesn't do that, if he doesn't have uh, the remnant church in, uh, to give the kingdom to, then Jesus Christ loses it all as well. Uh, this is not just based on his victory. He has only the strategic victory. But as yet, not all things are put under him. And the significance here is simply that, uh, that unless he has the ability to put all things under him and subdue all things, the kingdom will never come for him and the people who have believed on him. There has to be uh, men who hold steadfast what Christ said to do so that he can give them the rewards when he comes. Salvation and rewards when he comes at the kingdom. And that's when eternal salvation for them will be um, uh, dispensed. Now, here's the example. But we see Jesus who is made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor. For it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Now, what's going to happen here uh, uh, simply is that Jesus Christ is going to have to suffer. And he did. He was tested, and he had a right then to get the throne. But what does that mean for the kingdom church out here? That just like Jesus Christ, they were going to have to suffer. Now, there's a reason for it. Stay with me, and we'll uh, be dis dismissed here just shortly. We started a little early, actually. Jesus Christ suffered and was perfected, and that's what they have to do. They have to suffer in order to be perfected. Now, where do we get this? Turn with me to the book of, um, of uh, well, we're in Hebrews. Let's go to chapter 12. Chapter 12 and verse number 23. To the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. Now, what does this have to do with anything? Simply this. Jesus Christ was made perfect through suffering. Even though he was God as man, he had to be tested throughout all of his life and not sin. Uh, and the very same thing is going to be true of his followers. Now, it doesn't mean they're, they're going to have sinless perfection, but, but they hold fast what was promised them to the end of their life. And in, in that sense, they are thought to be made perfect. So when it talks about the spirits of just men made perfect, it's talking about the kingdom church. Those who are members of the uh, kingdom church who have obeyed God and have kept the perfection that he has insisted on throughout the time until the kingdom arrives and or their death in the faith. Now that's important. If they die a martyr's death, they have to die in the faith. Now, where do we get this matter of, of the kingdom church being made perfect? Come back with me, um, if you will, the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 11. And in this we have insight as to why God gives Israel another 75 days after the, uh, the tribulation period is over. The whole tribulation and those 75 days are perfecting days. He's uh, going to boil off the dross as it were. 
Uh, he's going to see who's going to stand true under very intense circumstances. And the intensity builds from the time the tribulation starts to the end. And then, then 75 days afterwards, it really gets bad. Note verse number uh, 32 of Daniel 11. And it says, And such as do wickedly against the covenant, he'll corrupt by flatteries. But the people who do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. They that understand among the people shall instruct many. Yet they shall fall by the sword, by flame, by captivity, by spoil, many days. Uh, so there's going to be persecution. What? By the way, uh, anyone uh, want to venture um, a guess about that word spoil there and, um, and the keys of the kingdom? What do you have to do? You have, you have to get you're the spoiling of your goods. That's addressed, by the way, in the book of Hebrews. Uh, you, in order to sustain possessions in the tribulation, you've got to take the mark of the beast. But if you, if you want to be in the kingdom, you have to give up your goods. So they're spoiled. But it says, when they shall fall, they shall be helped with a little help. But many of them shall cleave with flatteries. And some of them of understanding shall fall to try them and to purge them and to make them white even to the time of the end. And that's what's being referred to in the book of Hebrews. The perfecting of the kingdom saints put under intense pressure. Will they crack or will they hold fast to the words of Christ and be obedient to the end? Will they endure to that time? Come to chapter 12. Verse number nine. And he says, go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed to the time of the end. And at that time, speaking of the tribulation period, many shall be purified and made white. This is the process of perfecting them to get into the kingdom. Uh, he is purging out the remnant. Those who stay true enter the kingdom. Those who, who um, uh, go back to perdition are rejected. So it says, they'll uh, be purified, made white, and tried. But the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand. What won't they understand? He that endures to the end shall be saved. He that perseveres to that time, uh, God will let him in the kingdom. None of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. All right, uh, let's look at one more uh, a portion that we'll uh, then start, take up with um, next time. Let's go to the book of um, Matthew. Matthew 24. takes us right into the tribulation period. And Jesus Christ once again establishes the terms of their salvation. Where it says in verse, verse number, um, let's go to, to verse number uh, nine and then read on. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you. Ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Now, the word hatred there is not just for the Jews, not just a time of anti-Semitism, but a special group of Jews that are believers in Jesus Christ. Remember that Antichrist, during the first part of, of the tribulation period, helps the Jews. Uh, he protects the Jews. But those Jews that he protects persecutes another group of Jews, uh, brother against brother, as Abel in, in Hebrews 11 is going to illustrate. It's uh, kin to kin there. All right. 
Many shall be offended, betray one another, shall hate one another, and many false prophets shall arise and deceive many. Because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure to the end of the tribulation, the same shall be saved. The gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness to all nations. Then the end shall come." So everything is focusing on their staying true until, the, uh, until either they're captured and die in the faith or Jesus Christ returns and establishes the kingdom.